And this evening, we hope to learn a lot more about uh, creating uh, vibrant urban centers that can help all of Northeast Ohio attract and retain talent we need for regional economic prosperity. And now I'm pleased and really honored to introduce our speaker for this evening, a talent attraction expert from Portland, Oregon, Joe Courtright. He's quoted regularly in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, The Economist, Business Week, and USA Today. And hopefully tomorrow in the Beacon Journal. Joe is here this evening to offer his presentation, Attracting Talent through the Development of Vibrant, vibrant Urban Centers. Please join me in giving a fine Northeast Ohio welcome. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Is the audio working for everybody? Okay, good. My voice is a little shaky this evening, so you may have to bear with me. Um, I do appreciate the opportunity to be here today and, and the willingness of all of you to listen to an economist. Uh, you all know the definition of an economist, right? It's uh, somebody who's good with numbers but doesn't have the personality to be an accountant. <laughs> But we can't say that anymore because accounting has changed so much in the last few years. Today, uh, an economist is somebody who's good with numbers but isn't creative enough to be an accountant. <laughs> um, and this is the time of the year when economists are usually asked to present their economic forecast for the coming year. I'm grateful that you didn't ask me to do that today. It, but uh, one of the questions I'm always asked is, do you have um, uh, you know, everybody can read the newspaper and see the same economic data reported and the same economic indicators. Do you as an economist have any indicators that you look at that aren't generally published that can give us an idea as to what the future state of the economy is? And I have to say, there's one infallible indicator that I have as an economist that tells me what the next year's economy is going to be like. And that's, uh, when is the economist invited to speak in the program? If the economist is invited to speak in a breakout session at the end of the day uh, and given 10 minutes, then you know the economy is in great shape. If the economist is the keynote speaker and has a full room and as everybody's undivided is the only speaker, you know the economy is in serious trouble for the year. So, but that will be the extent of my economic forecast. But I do want to say, and I'll just mention this briefly, that we are in extremely difficult times right now. We are in, in very pivotal times, and, and I think it's difficult to underestimate the set of challenges that we face as a nation. And while these are difficult and dangerous times, I think within them there are clearly opportunities, opportunities for change. And you know, really the building that we're in right in here is a remarkable example of the kind of change that can take place in cities. Uh, because just a few years ago, this building was, was derelict. It was basically housing some homeless people. Uh, it, was, it was falling down, and now it's been restored. Um, so I, I think as we think about the economies, we think about the nation being in a period of crisis, uh, crisis is always an, a, a chance for opportunities to change things. And what I want to suggest to you tonight is that there are big opportunities to change the path of the nation if we think about the role of cities and the role of cities and talent attraction. And I'll be doing that today by covering uh, these six points. Um, these are the things that I'll, I'll be talking about in the course of the presentation. And just to give you the quick rundown, first I'll talk about what's really the ongoing transformation of the U.S. economy into a knowledge economy. And we're in a place, you know, Akron and with, uh, I stayed in the, in the, uh, in the Quaker uh, Square development today, you know, which are really iconic of an economy that was based on things and physical stuff and making things. And I don't want to suggest that that's unimportant anymore, but what I want to suggest is more and more our economy is driven by our ability to create new knowledge. And there are some implications from that shift to a knowledge economy that have important implications for cities. Then I'll talk about the role of talent in our economy and the role of talent in determining the success of individual communities and give you some basic understanding of how critical that role is. Um, third, I, I'm going to talk about innovation, uh, the role of creating new ideas and driving local economic prosperity. Then I'm going to talk about connections, how we build connections in particular places and how that really facilitates the growth of economies. 
Then I'll talk about distinctiveness. Um, and it turns out that in a global economy, uh, what Tom Friedman calls a flat earth, uh, it really does still matter where you're located because things happen in particular places and not in others. So knowing how your place is different from other places uh, turns out to be critical to its long-term economic success. And then finally, I'll be talking about the role of urban vitality, how all these things come together in particular places and enable you to have a successful city. Let me first of all talk about knowledge and the shift to what I call a knowledge-based economy. And I want to distinguish here between knowledge and information. Information isn't just anything you can Google, anything that you can look up, anything that can be written down. Knowledge is actually the ability to take information and do something with it. And knowledge is embedded in, in people, in organizations, in institutions and places, and in particular in cities. So if you think about a knowledge economy, it's not the ability to look up something on the internet. It's the set of relationships that exist in your place and the set of talents that exist in people and their ability to take those talents and do things with them. And that's always actually been the source of, of growth in economies, but more and more it's the ability to add to that stock of knowledge that drives economic growth. And as economists, as we think about what drives economic growth, um, we think there's a real uh, a transformation that's occurring. Historically, the sets of assets that drove economies, that determined whether places were successful, were the things that we inherited. Uh, and starting at the top of this list, if you think about natural resources, if you think about the mineral resources, the fertile farmland, falling water as a source of energy. Those were things that historically drove the growth of cities. A place like Pittsburgh, for example, had a special advantage because it was located relatively close to both iron ore and to coal, which turned it into a center for steel. And that, in effect, determined where economic activity would occur in the industrial age. But as you look at the things that cause places to be competitive, to, to enable them to generate wealth, it's changing. And it's, it's now no longer about so much about resources, although resources are still a factor for some industries. And it's no longer about costs, per se. It's shifting to these other things. It has to do with proximity, the ability to interrelate with other people. What we call clusters of industry, where there are groups of people who all specialize in the same or a closely related, related set of economic activities. It's the ability to create new ideas. It's the base of talent that you have in your community. And because talent is mobile, and I'll return to this theme, the quality of life that you have in community it turns out to be very important to anchoring wealth in your community. And as I've suggested here in the chart, the other thing that's true is we're shifting from a set of assets that we largely inherited, you know, the, the, the productivity of the soil or the distribution of water power, for example, to things that we actually create. All of the things at the bottom of the list there, knowledge, talent, quality of life, and clusters, are things that are the product of human activity. And so what that implies is we have a lot more responsibility now for doing things that will influence the ability of our communities to be successful. And that's one of the critical implications of the shift to a knowledge economy. Now, one of the shorthand things that people have done in when we acknowledge that there is a knowledge economy, and I think everybody recognizes that, is to assume that it's just about institutions of higher education. And clearly universities and colleges play an important role, as does the entire education system, in a knowledge-based economy. Uh, they play crit critical roles in helping young people acquire sets of skills and knowledge that they'll need to have to be successful in the world. They also do a lot of research. But one of the things that I want to suggest to you is if you limit your definition of the knowledge economy just to what happens in universities or educational institutions, you're missing half of the story. Because knowledge, again, is embodied in relationships and communities. And so cities, as well as education institutions, can be thought of as repositories of and creators of knowledge. You know, there's an old sign that hung over the gates of the Hanseatic cities in Germany. And in my mangled German, I would pronounce it as Stadt Luft macht frei, which means city air breathes free. 
And one of the things that happened during the late Middle Ages, when those Hanseatic cities were successful centers of commerce, was that they had essentially very liberal, very open institutions, liberal in the sense of free to do what you wanted to do, that you weren't bound by tradition and, and rules and the sort of feudal anachronisms. And people could do things differently. They could be entrepreneurs. Uh, they could pursue different uh, trades. They could develop, as they did, uh, a different religious beliefs and so on. And that role of cities and freedom and openness to new ideas played a critical role in the industrial development of Europe and uh, the emergence of modern economies. And that's actually an idea that was, you know, that I thought uh, Jane Jacobs articulated very well in a book that she wrote now more than 40 years ago called The Economy of Cities. And one thing she said was, cities are about what she called new work, that is the creation of new ideas. Cities take people, throw them together, and it's the interaction of people the unexpected, unplanned, uh, in, oftentimes inexplicable interaction of people that produces new ideas. And that was true when Jane Jacobs wrote it in the 1960s. It's just as true today. And we know cities are really crucibles of knowledge creation. And while uh, what we tend to emphasize is, you know, can you come up with the next iPod or the next cell phone or the next technological advance, some of the innovations that happen in cities are social. Some of them are political, some of them are institutional, some of them are managerial, um, some of them are uh, broader than just the mere economic in innovations. And all of these kinds of knowledge creation go hand in hand. So as we think about a knowledge economy, the two things I want you to keep in mind are, first of all, that it's, n it's about this need to have uh, created assets rather than inherited assets. We're responsible for creating our own new knowledge. And while institutions of higher education are absolutely critical, they're just one piece of the puzzle. We need to have communities, we need to have cities that embrace this notion of idea creation if we're to live successfully in a knowledge economy. Now what I want to talk about is the next four bullet points on my, my outline, uh, which are what we call the city vitals. And this is a framework that we developed with CEOs for cities for explaining what we think the critical um, recipe is for cities to be successful in a global knowledge-based economy. And we think there are four components of it here. And I'll explain what each of them are. These are the little ideograms that we came up with. Um, they are talent, innovation, connections, and distinctiveness. Now, one of the things I want to suggest to you is this is really a framework for thinking about what cities need to do. So City Vitals is our framework for what cities ought to be thinking about if they're going to be successful in this kind of knowledge economy. One of the things I want to stress here is every city has to figure out its own combination of how it's going to address each of these four factors. I will not suggest to you that there's a single recipe out there that I know that will work for any city, that will work for Akron, that will work for every city. Every city is in a slightly different situation and has to figure out how it can develop its talent, how it can promote innovation, what innovations it promotes, how it's connected both to itself and to other cities and other places, and then what makes it distinctive. <laughs> and so this is really, again, a framework rather than a recipe for thinking about urban vitality. Um, but I'll walk through each of these four points and describe to you why we think they're important. We think, you know, and this one is far and away, you know, if we had to rank them, the most important. You've got to be talented. You have to have a, a good set of knowledge and skills in your city to be successful. So developing talent is absolutely the critical thing that you have to do. Now, there are other things you have to do as well, but talent is absolutely foundational. Now, one of the things that we know about education and educational attainment, which is our way of measuring talent. Now, ideally, we'd like to be able to um, look at each, every each and every individual person and recognize that there are lots of ways that you can acquire and express talent and be able to measure it uniquely for each individual. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have the data to do that. We do have data that tell us how many years of schooling people have completed. And one of the things that we know from that data is the more education you have, on average, the more productive you are and the better paid you are. Uh, 25, actually closer to 35 years ago now, in the mid-1970s, you saw this stair-step relationship uh, between educational attainment and individual income. 
so that somebody with a high school degree earned about $25,000, $23,000, somebody with a four-year degree earned about $37,000, somebody with an advanced degree earned even more. Mm -hmm. Now over the succeeding decades, what we know is that stair step of progression that you saw between educational attainment and income, that staircase became steeper. It clearly, clearly became much more uh, remunerative, much higher return to education between the 1970s and uh, the most recent decade. Uh, and these numbers, I should say, are inflation adjusted, so they're expressed in the same, num same dollar numbers for each year. So we know uh, that the returns to education have increased and that people with more education are both more productive and better paid. Um, and what's true for individuals is also true for places. Places that have better educated populations have higher incomes than, and more economic success and are more productive than places where the population has a lower level of education. Now, as an economist, I'm required to stick in at least one regression equation in every presentation. This is the only one I'm going to show you. It may be an unpleasant reminder of some undergraduate course for some of you, um, but I'll make it as painless as I possibly can. On the horizontal axis, we show the percentage of the adult population that has completed a four-year degree. So this is the, the population 25 and older that have at least a BA degree. And, this, and each of these observations are one of the 50 largest metropolitan areas in the United States. The vertical axis shows the level of per capita income in each metropolitan area. So over at the, up at the high end there, you see New York at the top. It's got about a 35% four-year attainment rate, and per capita income is over $50,000 a year. At the other end, San Antonio and Las Vegas are in the 20 to 25% range and have per capita incomes, re respectively, of 40,000 for Las Vegas, about 34,000 for San Antonio. And what that line shows you is that there's a pretty strong um, positive correlation between the level of income in these metropolitan areas, and, or the level of education and the level of income, in fact, the R square is 0.58, which tells you that one factor alone, knowing the educational attainment of the population, explains close to 60% of all of the variation in per capita income at the metropolitan level. So, and this relationship, we've observed over time, has grown stronger over time. So it's a more powerful relationship than it has been in the past. So that's the first thing we know, is talent is absolutely critical to um, determining the economic success, both of individuals and then of metropolitan areas. Um, and so one of the things that we've done, now that we know this, I should back up a second. What this tells us is, each increment of per capita income, or each increment of educational attainment is associated with an improvement in per capita income. So if you can move your city to the right of this chart, you would expect other things being equal given this relationship, that your income would increase. And so working with CEOs for cities, we've essentially done that calculation for every metropolitan area in the United States. We've said given this relationship between education and per capita income, what would be the effect on income for a metropolitan area if you were able to move its um, educational attainment by one percentage point, say from 30 to 31, for example. And if you look at Akron, increasing the educational attainment in the Akron metropolitan area as measured by a one percent increase in the four-year attainment rate would be the equivalent of a $500 million increase in, per ca in total income in this region. So it's, it has very significant economic effects. Now I should say, hasten to say is, we're using that per capita, that, that four-year attainment rate as our measure of the distribution of skills. So we're talking about a shift of the whole uh, educational distribution in, in Akron, which would be big enough to produce that one percentage gain in college attainment. So the economic stakes for improving education actually turn out to be very, very high at the metropolitan level. Um, now, just to show you where Akron stands relative to this group of 50 large metropolitan areas, and I should add here, these charts that you'll see that show 50 metro areas, I haven't labeled all of them, uh, include all the metropolitan areas with a million or more population. As you all probably know, Akron is a little bit below that threshold, it's about 700,000. So this isn't necessarily a fair comparison group for Akron, but I'll, I'll show you where Akron stacks up relative to those 50 large metropolitan areas. Just, just about middle of the pack in terms of educational attainment, about, 
about 29% of the adult population with a four-year degree in 2008, according to the Census Bureau. Um, the highest are very well-educated places, Washington, D.C., San Francisco, San Jose, um, New York, and so on. Um, high enrollment areas, now one of the ways obviously that you end up with lots of well-educated people is by having a substantial higher education system. This shows that relative to the 50 largest metropolitan areas in the United States, you have a very large fraction of your young adult population enrolled in, in uh, four-year education or post, I should say, uh, uh, post-high school education. Uh, and this number is the percentage of 18 to 24-year-olds. So we look at everybody 18 to 24 and count how many 18 to 24-year-olds or what fraction of 18 to 24-year-olds are enrolled in some sort of post-secondary uh, educational institution. The highest is Austin, uh, University of Texas, but you're not far behind them. Pretty close to 50% of the young adults in Akron are enrolled in school, which is, which is a very good number, a very high number relative to the rest of the United States. Um, but as you can imagine, you don't hang on to all of those graduates. Uh, and we don't have the detailed breakdown by age group of migration statistics, but the migration statistics compiled by the Census Bureau show that Northeast Ohio generally, and the Midwest in particular, or I should say the Midwest generally, and, and Northeast Ohio in particular, have been places that have seen pretty substantial out-migration of the population, net domestic migration, over most of this decade. Uh, there are a couple of exceptions to that. Columbus and Indianapolis have seen modest net domestic in-migration over that period. Uh, but that's one of the big challenges. So it's clearly not enough simply to educate your young people. You also have to build communities where those young people will want to stay. So that's a big challenge for this region, obviously. And it's a big challenge in part because when you talk to young adults, um, we find that um, talented young people are changing in what it is that they're looking for in a place to live. And this is a result of a, a survey that we did a few years ago of 1,000 25 to 34 year old college graduates from throughout the United States, random selection of these folks. And we asked them, which of the following two statements do you most identify with? Do you identify with the sort of the career oriented statement that I'm going to look for the uh, best job that I can and pretty much go wherever it takes me? Or I'm gonna, am I gonna choose the place that I want to live and then look for my job there. And by pretty much a two to one margin, young college graduates identified with that second statement, that they were gonna choose the community that they wanted to live in and pursue their career there. And we think that's a particularly important shift and it, it reflects a number of changes in our society. Key among them is the fact that this is a generation that has grown up in a period where there was virtually no expectation of lifelong employment with a single employer. It used to be uh, that you could get a job when you left high school or college, and there was a good chance that that job or that employer would take you through, through retirement. Nowadays, people recognize that that's not the case, or that it's fairly unlikely to be the case for most, most young adults, and that the way that they ensure their job security is not through allegiance to a corporation, or a particular employer, but by building a network in a particular place. And it clearly is a network generation that relies on its contacts, its peers, its connections to pursue its careers rather than on uh, loyalty to corporations. So let me talk about innovation. Um, part of the reason we care about knowledge is because it makes people more successful as, as workers, but we also know that Places that have lots of really well-educated people tends to be the font, the font of, of new ideas and that um, they help do things that make businesses more productive and help the overall economy grow. And it's hard to find the good data about knowledge the way we can find data about education. Uh, one of the things we look at is patents, how many patents are issued, which is a measure sort of of the inventiveness of the local population. And it's a very skewed distribution. I mean, when you looked at education, there was about a two to one difference between the highest and the lowest. About 40% of the adult population in the highest areas had a four year degree, about 20% of the lowest. You can see this distribution is much more skewed than that. A place like Silicon Valley, which is San Jose, California, is you know, basically off the charts. 
uh, but then there's some leading areas that have, you know, roughly speaking, 10 times as, mo as many uh, patents uh, on a per capita basis as places at the bottom of the list. And, and I've just highlighted, not to pick on Oklahoma City, you can see there are a bunch of other places that are about in the same place that they are. They just happen to have the lowest. Akron, you know, with its legacy really of inventiveness here and creativity here in a variety of fields, uh, ranks pretty highly. If you compare yourself to the 50 largest metropolitan areas, it's an area that has um, a, a relatively high level of inventiveness. Um, I haven't looked at that over time to see how that's changed, but that still is an indicator. <coughs> Excuse me, an indicator that there, there's relatively strong inventive activity here. Now, this this actually relates to the question I was asked just a minute. Excuse me, a minute ago, which is, <clears throat> you have to think up ideas, but then you want those ideas to get turned into businesses and into products and to create jobs locally. And there have been some work done on uh, academic innovation and and looking at um, the relationship between the size of a metropolitan area and the productivity of academic investment. And it turns out that when you look at a, a fixed amount of academic R&D, and the calculation was done on $300 million, $300 million in ac academic R&D, and these are the population levels of these metropolitan areas. So in the, in the really big metropolitan areas, which would be Chicago-sized metropolitan areas, $300 million produces a hundred uh, innovations, a hundred patents, or similar types of activities. In the next smaller ones, about uh, you know about eight, uh, an eighth of that, about 16 um, innovations, and in the, in the less populated metropolitan areas, even further. And what that tells you is an illustration of the point that I was making between you know the role of cities and universities in creating ideas. That it isn't just enough to have people generating ideas. I'm sure the researchers in the smaller cities are every bit as smart and, and coming up with as good as ideas. There are just fewer opportunities for them to connect to other people. So it turns out that um, one of the things that you want to try and do is think about ways if you're in one of these smaller tiers and you're sort of between the 1 million and the 400,000, what are the things that you can do to offset that or, or to duplicate that connectivity advantage that larger cities have? Can you do things that help your researchers and the people who come up with ideas in your community connect with people who are likely to turn them into businesses? Because those large cities have the advantage simply because of the depth of, and diversity of their, of, uh, of their economies, size of their economies. Uh, the way the researchers put it is, you know, there seems to be a, fact, a factor of critical mass that it isn't just enough to have the university research, you have to have a critical mass of local economic activity. So, you know, it's easy to get it if you're a place like Chicago, which has a lot of diversity and a lot of activity. In a place like Akron, you're gonna have to work harder to build those connections in your community in order to be successful and tap into uh, the ideas that you do produce locally. And that brings me to this, this issue of connections. How do you develop connections what are the nature of connections that are important in your community? And connections is an even harder area to measure. As we go through this progression of talent, innovation, connections, distinctiveness, you'll see that we're, we're getting on thinner and thinner ice statistically. But we do have some indicators that we think tell us a little bit about how well uh, communities function in terms of connections. And I should add that there's a publication called City Bibles, which is on the uh, CEOs for Cities website that you can download for free, which has a complete benchmarking tool that we've developed that has benchmarks in each of these four areas that go into a lot more detail than I'm able to present to you this evening. So if you're really interested in this one and dig into the numbers further, I invite you to go to ceosforcities.org and download the, the, uh, the full report. Just to give you an example of one of the things that we use to look at connections, we looked at the relative voter turnout in different metropolitan areas in the last presidential election to get an idea of what fraction of the adult population that was eligible to vote actually turned out. So we, we basically ignored voter registration here. We just said how many adults are there, people 18 and older, living in each of these metropolitan areas, and what was the voter turnout in each of those metropolitan areas. And you can see there's a pretty wide variation across the United States. You know, 70%, actually closer to 75% of turnout in, uh, in Minneapolis, in Riverside, only a shade over 40% of the adult population voted. 
Now, some of that has to do with, um, el excuse me, eligibility to vote. In Riverside, there are a lot of people who are immigrants into the United States who may not be citizens and be able to vote. That's part of it. But even after you control for factors like that, there's still very wide variations in, in voter turnout. Akron, as you can see, ranks very highly um, in terms of voter turnout. That means you have a large section of your population that cares enough uh, to vote. And it was the same presidential election in, in all, uh, all of these metropolitan areas. And again, these are metropolitan data. Um, but there are a lot of different aspects to connections and connectivity. And we think there are really two dimensions to this. One is one that's picked up by this, which is uh, the connection of a community to itself. How easy is it for people in the community to relate to one another, to interact with one another, to connect with one another? It's the sort of thing that Robert Putnam called social capital. The other thing that we think is important, particularly in a global economy, is the connections from your place outside the community. That is the extent to which people and businesses in your community can easily relate to people elsewhere in the country and increasingly today elsewhere in the world. So we pulled together data on things like foreign travel, the fraction of the adult population that has a passport, the number of foreign students that are studying in your community and, and things like that to pick up the international connectedness of cities. And I didn't have that data for Akron, so I haven't shown it, but you can look at the indicators that we have in, in the city vitals report. But we think both of these kinds of connections are important. How well wired you are internally and then how well you connect to the rest of the world. So in addition to um, voter turnout, you should be and density and things like that, and thinking about social capital, which I think is very important, which gets into institutions and community. Uh, and this connection between the business and academic world, that is how well your universities interact with businesses, which is going to be important if you're going to have successful t technology transfer. And then one other concept that, uh, that we've uh, highlighted, which is called buzz and pipelines. And buzz and pipelines means these two sets of connections are complementary. That is, you want to have strong local buzz. You want to have people who are working on ideas where you're a hotbed of knowledge here locally, which it might be in polymer sciences, for example. But then you want to recognize that there are other places in the world that are also have their own buzz, that are also strong, and do you have good connections to them? So does, do the people in Akron who are really good in particular areas find it easy and natural to connect with people outside the community? Uh, because we think both of those kinds of connections will be important to being success, successful. Um, the next thing I want to emphasize is distinctiveness. And in many ways, this is the most elusive thing to measure. And what I mean by distinctiveness is, are there attributes of your community that make you different from every other place in the United States and in the world? Uh, and we have a lot of good reasons to believe that distinctive characteristics are really important to successful strategies. And if you, you know, look at business strategy, the, you know, the guru of business strategy at the Harvard Business School, this guy named Michael Porter, he wrote, and he was talking about businesses when he said this, he said, competitive strategy is about being different. It's about being able to do things that your rivals can't easily duplicate. And he subsequently said that applies equally well to cities. Uh, but going back to Jane Jacobs, who was thinking about this a lot longer, she said, the greatest asset that a city can have is something that's different from every other place. A friend of mine, Mary Jo Waite, says, think about what makes your place first, best, or only in some respect. Now, I'm not an expert in Akron. You all are experts in Akron. But when I say, you know, what makes you first, best, or only in some regard, there should be some things that in your part spring immediately to mind. I'm sure you're all, as I said, all experts. Now, one of the things that we try to do is measure the nature of distinctiveness. And, and in many ways, that's kind of a self-defeating proposition. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about the 50 large metropolitan areas and think about how each one of them is first, best, or only in some way, you should have 50 different measures and each one of them should rank first in, in some measure. But one of the things that we were able to do was to look at a variety of data on consumer behavior, on business activity, on occupational composition, and so on. And we looked at about 60 different indicators. And we looked at how similar each metropolitan area was to the rest of the United States compared to how different it was. That is, did consumer behaviors in each metropolitan area exactly 
mimic the national average or were they really different from the national average? And we constructed something we called a weirdness index. And the weirdness <laughs> index measures how different you are from the rest of the country in terms of, again, 60 different behaviors. Uh, I've highlighted Salt Lake, actually San Francisco is the weirdest city in the United States. Um, we computed, uh, at, these are, that's actually the number for Cleveland, but Akron is, is going to be real close. Cleveland, Columbus, and Cincinnati are all in the bottom five. Um, so you're the least weird. I, I, um, the other two cities in the bottom five are Kansas City and St. Louis. St. Louis is the least weird city in the United States. I did a presentation there about three months ago, and and they decided to say that you need to turn this index upside down and say <laughs> it's the normalness index. And they're the most normal city in the United States. Where, 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 where is Portland? Portland's in the top ten. Not the, not the weirdest, but, but a little bit weirder than average, I'd say. But this is really an imperfect measure. I mean, it does tell you, if you're, you know, if you're thinking about market research terms, a place like, you know, a city in Ohio, a mid-sized city in Ohio, is a good marker for the entire U.S. population because its, its attitudes, beliefs, behaviors closely mirror the averages for the rest of the country. Um, so, How do you but, measure weirdness? Big part? How do you measure weirdness? Oh, that's, well, weirdness is, again, we looked at 60 different behaviors as a measure of variance. And so if the difference between your city's um, performance on each of these 60 indicators was very low, then you score very low in weirdness. If your um, measurement on each of those 60 indicators vary substantially, either higher or lower than the national average, then you've got a, a high, a high uh, weirdness score. Can you give a, a few examples of this? Sure, behaviors? sure. We, we looked, at, you know, as you know, market researchers are measuring just about everything you do. So we looked at what people spend their money on, so it's the composition of consumer expenditures, we looked at magazine subscriptions, we looked at movie uh, attendance, which movies you watch, which television shows you watch, um, what kind of computers you buy, what kind of hobbies and recreational activities you engage in, what kind of physical fitness activities, and so on. So it's a composite of 60 different indicators. I can get you the whole list if you like, but it's a, it's a fairly standard set of consumer data. So let me talk a little bit more, since this, I, I'm not satisfied by this uh, measure of weirdness, not, nor should you. You have to think about your, the special characteristics of your community. But you know, aside from uh, trivial pursuit, um, what could be the possible use of this? And what I want to do is, is give you an example from a city that I actually do know something about um, and tell you a little bit about how it's different from other places. I come from Portland. And there's a really interesting thing you can do with Google and Google Trends. You can look and see what people in your community are searching for and how their searches compare to searches in other places. And I did this uh, last year. And it turns out that among the 50 large metropolitan areas in the United States, Portland ranks first in the number of people who, on a per capita basis who search for sustainability, vegan, farmer's market, cyclocross, microbrew, Dragon Boats, we were second to Seattle for Espresso, and fourth for uh, Fixie. Um, again, aside from Trivial Pursuit, why might that be interesting? Well, some of the data we've dug into in physical activity shows that when you look at measures of physical activity and recreational activity outdoors and so on, uh, Portland is essentially at the top of the charts on almost everything, where you talk about camping, twice as likely, 60% more likely to go hiking or backpacking, more likely to do golfing or hunting, uh, very um, high in physical activity, very low in sedentary activity, according to the health research data that's out there. Uh, the only thing that we're, off, that we're low on is theme park attendance, where we rank last in theme park attendance. Some people say that's because we live in a theme park. Um, <laughs> but uh, why, why might this be important? Well, let me give you an example of why we think this is important. Um, back in the 1960s, back in the time when adult, normal adult Americans didn't uh, sweat in public uh, when they could avoid it, uh, a bunch of people in Oregon started running and jogging for health. Um, a number of them were in Eugene, Track City, USA. Uh, and this guy started selling these runners Japanese sneakers out of the back of his station wagon. And you all know uh, the name of the company that he started. The guy was Phil Knight, he sells Nike. Um, and for a period of time, Nike was the only Fortune 500 company headquartered in Portland. 
Uh, and today, the athletic apparel and sportswear industries um, uh, account for about 10,000 people working in the Portland metropolitan area. And it's a, it's a globally important industry. Now there's no reason, no technical reason, why that industry should be in Portland. In fact, if the best minds of American business and economics had gotten together, say, in the 1960s, about this time of starting, and said, what's the logical place for a company that's making shoes to be located? They probably would have been a lot more likely to say Akron, Ohio, you know, rubber and, and materials, than they would have Portland, Oregon. So why is this company and all those jobs in Portland, Oregon? It has nothing to do with um, the natural resource endowments in terms of making shoes. In fact, Nike, as you know, doesn't make shoes there. Uh, it has everything to do with the fact that this weird behavior uh, that took off first in Portland happened there and gave this entrepreneur a little bit of an insight, a little bit of an edge into what's turned out to be a global market for recreational uh, apparel. So weirdness and this distinctive set of behaviors can give your entrepreneurs a little bit of a head start. Now not all of them turn out to be Fortune 500 companies, but I think that gives you a little insight into the way a knowledge-based industry uh, gets started today. Now I want to tie this all together, all of these strands together. So, so far what I've done is talk about the shift to a knowledge-based economy and how are these four ingredients of talent, innovation, connections, and distinctiveness. And now what I want to do is bring that all to ground in a particular place, or tie it to place and talk about the role that cities play in bringing these things all together. Um, and you may recall we spent some, I'm sorry, uh, spent some time talking about talent. Somebody asked me a question about whether my, my migration numbers dealt just with young people or college educated young people and they didn't. These are the numbers for the change in the college educated population uh, among metropolitan statistical areas in the United States uh, over the last decade for which, full decade for which we have data and show you which places have been the biggest gainers and which places have been the biggest losers of well educated young adults. And I'm sorry I didn't have the accurate numbers for these. Uh, but you can see that um, uh, at the bottom were places like St. Louis, New Orleans, Providence. This is pre-Katrina, by the way. And at the top, Charlotte, Austin, Portland, Atlanta, with 40 and 50 percent increases in the number of college-educated young adults. Now, the quiz question is, which, which city in the United States had the fastest increase <coughs> excuse me, in college-educated young adults in the 1990s? Anybody guess? Are you from that list of it? It's not on the list. Okay. It's number, I left off number one. Raleigh. Raleigh is not, it's not it's, uh, the, I'll give you a clue. It's the one that had the biggest increase in everything in that decade. Las Vegas. Las Vegas, Las Vegas. that's right. And paradoxically, even though it's, it had the largest increase, it's still certifiably the least well-educated large city in the United States. <laughs> and as you saw from those earlier numbers, had the lowest level of uh, college attainment. So, it was growing from a very low base. Um, these places all posted very substantial gains in their educational attainment as a region by attracting uh, talented young workers. So one of the things that we did, so we've looked at a number of these metropolitan areas in, in detail. We've done, done detailed studies in this group for Portland and Atlanta, and we've done six other cities around the United States and done uh, looked at the demographic characteristics of these young adults and done survey and focus group to, to figure out uh, where they're moving and why. And I'm going to zero in for a minute on, again on Portland, Oregon, which as you can see ranks number four here and had a 50% increase in the number of well-educated young adults uh, in the space of just a decade. Uh, which, by the way, the national increase during that time period was 10%. So the country as a whole went up by 10% in this young adult group. Portland grew five times faster uh, during that decade. And one of the things we did uh, was to look at where in the Portland metropolitan area was there an increase in talented young adults. Now I appreciate that this map doesn't probably mean anything. It's not a very good map to begin with. I apologize. Um, it's a map of Portland. It shows a dot for, for each, uh, I think, 50 young adults increase uh, over the period 1990 to 2000. Um, the reason I highlight this red circle here, that's a circle that is, is drawn three miles from the absolute center of downtown Portland. So if you're standing in the middle of the city, 
uh, and the, 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 the Pioneer Courthouse Square in Portland draw a three-mile circle around. That's what that red circle is. So it's absolutely in the center of the city. And then the, you know, the outer fringes are the suburbs there. You can see the biggest increase was basically, uh, for the most part, inside that, that circle. In fact, the number, the, the uh, overall, this is for all educational attainment, the 25 to 34 year olds increased 30% um, inside that circle and increased 10% outside that circle. So the number of young adults was growing three times faster inside that circle than it was growing outside that circle. So young adults are uh, also locating in uh, the, the west side of the region there too. But the really dramatic increase was in the close-in neighborhoods in Portland, very close to the downtown. And one of the things that we were able to do is measure the fraction of the young adult population with a four-year degree inside and outside that circle. For the whole region, uh, the number was about 27% of the adult population had a four-year degree for the region. Inside that circle, the number with a four-year degree is 54%. So what we know is that really well-educated people moving to the center of Portland was the big driver for that gain in talented young people uh, during the last decade. So we think close-in neighborhoods are key. Now, what we've done is we've duplicated this same exercise of drawing a three-mile circle around the center and counting where young adults live in the United States. And we've done that for each of the 50 largest metropolitan areas in the United States. And it turns out that compared to the rest of the population in the United States, young adults have always been somewhat more likely to live in those close-in neighborhoods. We did this in 1980 and 1990, and young adults were about 10 or 12 percent more likely than the rest of the population to choose to live in close-in neighborhoods. In the year 2000, they were 30 percent more likely than the rest of the population to choose to live in close-in neighborhoods. And the other thing that was very striking from a statistical standpoint, this measure of what we call relative preference for close-in, increased in every single one of the 50 largest metropolitan areas. So young people today are much more likely to want to live in close-in neighborhoods and cities uh, than were previous generations. And we think that, that marks a pretty significant shift in uh, attitude or in behaviors um, in, among this generation. Um, now, one of the things we did, I'm sorry, I apologize for balancing the slide, I want to set this up. Um, we did a lot of uh, focus group work with young adults, I and mean, we, uh, even before we came up with this, this finding, and one of the things we asked was, you know, what attracts you to a metropolitan area? What is it that leads you to choose um, some places rather than others? We got a variety of answers to that question. But time and again, and we got this in cities all across the country, were, um, what I would call the new urbanist bullet points. I'm looking for neighborhoods that are dense, diverse, that have a range of interesting commercial activity, that, have, that are bikeable and transit friendly, and that are walkable. Um, and that set of themes emerged in every single one of the large metropolitan areas. We think that's one of the critical differentiators that cities have, and that is really um, explains the neighborhoods that are the most successful in attracting uh, talented young people. What about yeah. having an urban university? Um, you know, that came up periodically, but one of the things that we heard was, you, you know, again, these are mostly people who have, who have completed their, their university degree. I think for them, at this stage in their life, K-12 is actually as frequently uh, mentioned or more frequently mentioned because that was germane to them. Even among, kid, uh, even among young people who didn't have children yet, that was one of the things that they're concerned about. So uh, urban school quality is a factor. K-12 probably more, more than the university. But again, we looked at the propensity of, we essentially controlled for that characteristic in cities. It was the, do young people want to live there relative to the whole population or not? So it's not affected by whether a lot of people live in the, in the center city or a few people. It's do young, are young people more likely to choose to live in the center than, uh, than uh, other people. And there are significant variations in that across metropolitan areas. But you're absolutely right. Some places have much larger close-in populations than, than other cities. Some are very spread out. 
we're, we're working on a project right now at CEOs for Cities called Kids in Cities that's looking at just that issue. And census gives us some snapshots in time, but it makes it really difficult for us to tell <coughs> if somebody who moved there at age 24, childless, right. stayed there in that same neighborhood later. But anecdotally, we know in a number of cities that they're seeing enrollment increases in close-in neighborhoods. But we don't have the level of data yet that would let me sort of confidently answer that question. We'll round that out by talking about another thing that we heard in the, in the focus groups was they said, we heard that people, again, were interested in part in what we call these new urbanist bullet points, that is, walkable, bikeable, transit-friendly neighborhoods, and then also a chance to live their values. And in Portland, one of the things that we've looked at is uh, transportation behavior and the, and the extent to which people drive. And this is, I apologize, it's a little bit blurry here, but it's a summary of a report we did called the Green Dividend. And the Green Dividend basically looked at what were the economic effects from the policies that we had of encouraging uh, less driving, more transit, more walkable, more bikeable, and so on. And what we discovered was that people in Portland drive about 20% less uh, than the typical American citizen, about 20 miles per day compared to about 24 miles per day in the average large city in the United States. And that doesn't sound like a big difference, but when you sort of calculate the economics of it, it turns out that that four miles per day means that people spend about a billion dollars a year less on cars and gasoline than they otherwise would. And that's important because Portland makes ni neither cars nor gasoline. So instead of that money being spent on things that leave the community right away, it gets spent mostly in the community on housing, on services, and retailing, and so on. And it's part of the reason why Portland has the second highest number of restaurants per capita of any large metropolitan area in the United States. So there, there are local economic impacts in addition to a, a, attracting the talent. I think what this, you know, I don't, I, I, I don't think it ever gets to $20 a gallon, but I do think our experience with $4 a gallon last year has fundamentally changed people's perceptions and we're already seeing that in behavior. People generally are driving less now than they were three, four, and five years ago. It's not just because of the recession. And, and I also think that it's an issue of uh, convenience and lifestyle as well. I th think people are really interested in uh, looking at neighborhoods that offer them a set of choices where they don't have to drive for everything or don't have to drive as far when they do. Uh, in fact, um, I'll just throw up these numbers on cycling really quickly here. Portland ranks uh, highest in terms of cycling, about 2% of all commute trips. And these are commutes to work are, are by cycle. But let me just talk about this issue you just talked about. Um, of uh, walkability and walkable neighborhoods. This is a, a, a website that I'm not, not affiliated with. It's called WalkScore. Has anybody heard of WalkScore before? A few of you. Okay, WalkScore is basically a website that lets you calculate on a scale of from 0 to 100 the walkability of any property in the United States. So you could, you could essentially log into this website, type in your home address, and it will give you a score for your home of how walkable it is. And it's based on how far it is to the nearest of 13 or 14 common destinations. A school, a park, a bank, a coffee shop, a restaurant, um, a library, and so on. Now, they, they didn't do this nice heat map for, um, uh, um, for Akron. Uh, I found Columbus's. And you can see in the center of town, it's green, which means it's very, whoops, very walkable in the center. <laughs> and then out in the suburbs, not so walkable. Um, but you, the point is you can get a score for every house actually in the United States. And what we did is we um, got the walk scores for 100,000 houses around the United States, and we did a statistical model of what the relationship, after controlling for a whole bunch of other factors, controlling for how much walkability influenced home values. And we found uh, and these are the 15 cities that we looked at for the study. In all but two of them, uh, walkability had a significant positive effect on home values in cities around the United States. And that the, that the uh, difference between a house with an average level of walkability and an above average walk level of walkability was something on the order of about $30,000 uh, for a house. So places with, with more walkability that are more proximate, that have choices, 
uh, tend to command a higher value in the marketplace. The only exception was Las Vegas. More walkable houses in Las Vegas are worth less, and there's no relationship in Bakersfield. No <laughs> figure. And I don't know where this ends up. If you can tell me what the price of gasoline is five years from now, I'll have a much better answer for this. But I do think this idea of walkability, of convenience, of choices, and vibrant close-in neighborhoods being an advantage and being uh, headed in a different direction going forward, um, it, there's a lot of evidence to support that, that that's, that's the trend that we can look for. So let me wrap up by just talking about the implications of city vitals and what, what I think you do with all of this. First of all, you, you have to pay attention to talent. There are a lot of other things here that you need to work on as well, but if you don't do the job you need to do in educating your young people and also making sure that this is a place where talented people want to live, um, your, your economic development efforts, your community development efforts uh, will face serious problems. So it's a balance of both of those things, of bolstering your educational system and uh, retaining and attracting talent. You have to think about innovation not just as something that happens in research labs uh, or at businesses, but is really the result of the interaction of those two things. Uh, and that you have to push innovation, particularly in those areas where you have some ability to translate the innovations into jobs locally. And that means that connections are important. Uh, the connections within your community, all the things that you do to mesh all of the resources, all of the assets in this community together, to get people to interact, to make it really clear that your community is open to new people and new ideas, and so that newcomers can get connected to everybody else here, and so that you can connect to the wider world. Those things are very important. You have to figure out what your distinctive advantage is, what it is that um, is the compelling case for Akron that makes Akron different from, and in some ways better than, other places uh, anywhere else in the world. Uh, so that people know what they're about and, and, uh, and why they're here. And then finally, you need to think about the role of urban vitality and that building an urban core and having a strong urban core is a competitive advantage in attracting talent. And it's really about building what my colleague at CEOs for Cities, Carol Coletta, calls the new good life. Thinking about how in a world where we're going to have to deal with climate change, we're going to have to deal with higher oil prices, where the economy is going to force us to make changes, how we create a good life for Americans that, that we can enjoy that embodies all of those values and responds to all those challenges. And we think the place that it will happen will be in cities. And much as this house, you know, that was derelict a few years ago and was deeply challenged, is now you know, really a showpiece and a meeting place for this community, um, I think America's cities are on the cusp of a major change and will be real leaders in figuring out how we're going to live successfully through the challenges that we face in the 21st century. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight and thanks very much for your attention.